30 seconds and counting. 25 seconds and counting, we are still go. 20 seconds, guidance alert, the guidance system now going internal. 15, 14, 13, 12, 11, 10, 9, 8, ignition sequence start, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Good evening to my viewers in uh, Africa and in Europe. Good afternoon to most of my viewers in the Western Hemisphere. I think some of you are still watching in the late morning. And good very early morning to my viewers in the Pacific Rim. Welcome to the Angry Astronaut. Really appreciate you guys tuning in. We have a fairly uh, large crowd starting off right off the bat, over 150 people already uh, checking in. So where is everybody watching from? Uh, first of all, it's how we usually get going on this. Hello, Brooklyn. Love Brooklyn, by the way. Uh, definitely a, an awesome place. Birmingham. Hello. Um, not too far away from where I live now. Um, Birmingham, very close by. Hello, Titusville. Thank you very much. And uh, hello, Warsaw and Jacksonville, Houston, Texas, and Toronto. We have Phoenix. Um, and no, uh, angry sunglasses are generally only for my recorded videos. I can't see very well with them, to be honest. Um, wow, Guardian Bob, thank you so much. Thank you so much for your support. I really appreciate that right off the bat. That's the first time you've ever done a super chat, too. That blows my mind. Thank you so much. Um, let's see. So we have Malta and Kent. Uh, thanks very much uh, for, for tuning in. We have Hungary and Cornwall. No, two Cornwalls, back-to-back, -back, actually. French, Kanukistan, and uh, the Midlands, and, uh, and, of course, the UK. Lovettsville, Virginia, Derbyshire. Uh, hello, Taiwan and Liverpool and Eugene and uh, Munich and Plymouth, Estonia, Austria, Louisiana, Oregon. Um, thank you very much for checking in. Another Florida, Tucson, boy, all over the place. Uh, Leeds, um, thanks very much for tuning in. Uh, my uh, producer actually lives very close to you. Um, Ontario, Canada, New York. We got Netherlands and Amsterdam. We have Indianapolis, Den Denmark. Boy, all over the place. Centro <laughs> Vegas, England, Alabama, Stockholm, Alaska, Yorkshire again, uh, Axminster. Um, we also have Detroit, the Cotswolds, Christchurch. Oh, hello, New Zealand. Thank you very much for checking in. Um, Fairview, New Jersey. And hello, Marina from Ukraine, um, our, our wonderful Ukrainian uh, translator. Has been tuning into my channel for a very long period of time. Really appreciate that. Ooh, we have uh, we have an Estonian viewer um, from uh, I believe it's pronounced Tallinn. I'm try I uh, I think that's the capital of Estonia if I remember correctly. Um, that's that's great. Uh, we, we're getting more and more viewers um, from all over the place. Uh, you and you and Marina are actually uh, kind of neighbors. I know Ukraine's a huge country, so it can't really call Estonia. And, and Ukraine neighbors, but nevertheless, uh, very close by. People from all over, uh, once again, delighted. Over 250 people tuning in uh, today. Uh, super happy to have you here with us. So Starship, let's talk about Starship. Oh, yeah, and Frozen Iowa, by the way, there are some people um, who are uh, – experiencing some pretty extreme weather right now. Um, my best friend in the world um, in Colorado, she told me that uh, she's experiencing minus 13 degrees. Uh, that's uh, 13 degrees below zero Fahrenheit um, wind chill in Colorado. So pretty nasty weather in some areas. So everybody stay safe and stay warm. Um, and uh, Starship, let's try to get people caught up on, on what's happening with this. And uh, really, again, anytime we're talking about Starship, we're talking about SpaceX, we're talking about a lot of speculation. Um, it, 
SpaceX at, plays their cards pretty close to the vest a lot of the time. They don't really reveal a lot about the exact things that are happening minute to minute. For example, um, you know, when they submit a mishap report to the FAA, there's actually, you know, the, the there's actually an announcement, a public announcement that usually comes out when they submit the uh, the mishap report to the FAA. It happened the last time when they did the April 20th launch. Actually, at this point, the FAA has not acknowledged that they have received a mishap report um, from SpaceX, even though SpaceX is talking about a February launch. It could be just that the FAA isn't telling us. But that would be very odd um, because it kind of goes in contrast to, to what they were doing before. Um, I receive regular uh, communications from the FAA now. Um, I have a relationship with their public relations uh, person in Washington, D.C. Really good guy, by the way. Um, easy person to deal with. And he will promptly answer any questions that he's allowed to answer. Um, so as far as I know, um, the FAA has not yet received the mishap report from uh, SpaceX. And of course, it could be a bit of a complicated one because it's not just the booster, as uh, a lot of us probably know that Elon Musk uh, says that the booster was lost because oxygen was being vented off. And if Starship had been carrying a payload, it wouldn't have had as much excess oxygen. Um, and that might have, you know, that, and so that sudden venting is what caused perhaps loss of control of the booster and the destruction of it. But even if that is indeed the case, he didn't talk about why the orbiter was lost. Um, and both of those things need to be addressed. You know, they, they, the causes need to be tracked down and then the mishap report needs to be submitted to the FAA. Now, thus far, um, Chris, thank you so much for the tenor, my friend, really do appreciate that as always. Um, so, and by the way, when we're talking about, I've received some great support tonight already, really appreciate it. When we're talking about support, I actually have received an invitation to come to an FAA or to go to an FAA seminar in Washington, D.C. regarding the FAA's space policy um, and, and space policy decisions uh, and also their, um, their plans for increasing the speed of launch cadences, that sort of thing. Um, I, it's If this is something you would like me to attend, I think it might be very useful to actually get an opportunity to speak directly face-to-face -face with FAA representatives and try to get some more information about their processes, about their relationship with the, uh, SpaceX, that sort of thing. If this is something you would like to support, I'd it'd be pretty easy for me to go, to be honest, because I do have help with uh, with plane tickets. So I think overall, we'd only be talking about maybe the expense of hotels and stuff, maybe $500 maximum. If it is something you would like to support, um, links are in the description and just make sure you send a message saying that I want to support you going to the FAA conference. If it's something you guys, guys aren't that interested in, that's fine. You know, but I do think that it, it could have there could be some very useful information that we could gain from a uh, from an FAA conference that has to do specifically with space flight policy, um, especially given how many launches are taking place right now. And I, I didn't expect to get invited to it either, um, but I got the invitation a couple of days ago. Um, <laughs> it's a trap. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> They're going to take me out. Actually, for those of you who've, who've noticed a lot of my recent videos, I've actually gone pretty easy on the FAA. I really think that even though their, their processes may be antiquated and they still have to deal with a lot of red tape, that sort of thing, I do think that overall the FAA wants SpaceX to succeed. I think that they want um, to make it easier to facilitate uh, you know, SpaceX's launch cadence. There's a lot of things they could have done to screw up um, SpaceX's plans for the second launch for OFT2. They really could have delayed that a lot longer than they actually did. Um, so I think that they are actually more allies than adversaries. Of course, any government agency is going to have agendas and they're going to have people who work at those agencies that have agendas. But nevertheless, I, I don't 
look upon the FAA is as much of an adversary as some other government agencies. Um, so I think it could be very useful to uh, to communicate. Once again, that's entirely up to you guys. Um, now, as far as Starship's next launch, we've heard two pieces of information, which I think are very important. Number one, you know, was Elon communicating the cause of the loss of the booster, the oxygen venting. And he said that next time he's very confident that SpaceX will make it to orbit. Well, I think his exact words were he got a really good shot at it. In other words, he's not 100% sure, but he's feeling pretty optimistic about it. So that's good because Starship needs to make it to orbit as rapidly as possible. Of course, I've got my own selfish reasons as to why maybe I didn't want SpaceX to make orbit until now, until Vulcan actually successfully did its job. Um, but now that they have, well, it's not as exciting as it was now. I'm going to have to come up with some other some other bet that involves me uh, having a tattoo. Anyway, um, so that's the first thing. But once again, he didn't explain why the orbiter, why Starship itself was lost. And that needs to be identified um, also. Um, so Starship was lost because of the venting. He's saying not the booster. Interesting. Okay, so there's the payload. So then we need to identify why both were lost. It was the booster. That that is interesting. So they got a lot more information about that. So we didn't see venting at the last moment there. Interesting. Okay. So regardless, um, the second piece of information that we got was the uh, interestingly enough um, was the um, uh, the the update from the SpaceX representative who was on the NASA conference call regarding the delays with Artemis. And she also said that they were anticipating that a flight in February is what that they are, what they are looking forward to. Um, so once again, is that aspirational? Um, you know, they, they always, the, 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 the information we always get is we're just waiting on the FAA to give us permission. That's what SpaceX says. But if we look at what happened with OFT2, it was actually a it was actually didn't take a whole lot of time from when it was announced that the mishap report was actually submitted and FAA and the FAA gave their approval. Has the mis, has a full mishap report actually been submitted to the FAA? We received no information from the FAA to confirm that that's actually happened. Maybe it has, and they just haven't told us, but that's not what they did the last time. Elmar, thank you so much for the $5. Really, really appreciate um, your support. Thank you very much. Um, inverse gravity effect is 25. Pardon? Jeez, a lot of people watching, by the way. Really appreciate the massive crowd that we have. I'm going to look at Michael Maxey's comment here real quick. Elon announced the cause of the B9 destruction was an inverse gravity effect. As 25 ignition caused slosh and B9 locks venting caused the RUD of S25. Okay, so we have both because the news report I read said that the just the, that the explanations for both were not covered. Um, again, a lot of this stuff it's 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 always difficult to interpret some of this information. Inverse gravity effect makes a hell of a lot of sense, by the way. This is something that has been theorized quite a few times um, since the uh, since the hot staging process was implemented. When you fired up those engines directly on top of the booster, inverse gravity effect, in other words, pushing the booster was going this way, and then you get all that energy, all that kinetic energy coming back from S25, um, and so you have the booster either slowing down or perhaps even getting stopped in place there for a moment. Um, and then, of course, a huge amount of tank slosh existing as a result of that. Very possible. And once again, if that is indeed what caused the destruction of the booster, then the whole hot staging thing may be a little difficult um, to, to implement successfully. That, that could make things very challenging because you can't change the laws of physics, when those engines light on top of that booster, it is going to have a dramatic effect on the, on the uh, momentum 
of that booster. It's really going to change that dramatically. And, and any sort of sudden change in momentum is going to create propellant slosh. Um, how do you avoid that? Well, by you know maybe waiting for the for the the, the uh, booster and the orbiter to be separated a bit more before igniting the engines, in which case that's not really hot staging anymore. Um, but I think it, it may be necessary. Um, I you know I've always I always thought that you know the hot staging is a nice little bonus if it can be done, but at the same time if it is inhibiting. SpaceX's ability to successfully get Starship to orbit and to make it an operational rocket that can also be reused, then it just needs to be abandoned. Now, I'm not saying abandon it right now, but I'm saying that they should be prepared to do that should it become uh, necessary. Does the FAA trust them enough at this point to allow further tests, even though writing up mishap reports of previous tests? Um, that's That's a that's a good question. No. And it's not a matter of trust, actually. This is a matter of procedure. If a launch doesn't go exactly as expected, so in other words, if Starship doesn't make it to orbit, and also if Star Starship does, and then if the booster doesn't return to the spot that they anticipate that it's supposed to go to, and then if Starship does not re-enter the atmosphere and crash down somewhere off the coast of Hawaii, if all of those things do not transpire exactly as SpaceX has described in their flight plan, then that's a mishap. And they have to submit a mishap report to the FAA. And that's simply for the safety of the public. Anytime you have a flight that doesn't go, especially a big ass rocket, that doesn't go as you anticipated, that has you know a deviation of any kind, even a tiny deviation, then that requires a mishap report. Let me give you an example of just how petty that this stuff can get. There was a flight of, uh, of the um, Virgin Galactic Spaceship 2 that just went a tiny bit outside of the flight path, outside of the approved flight path. I mean, it, it didn't vary that much. And, and Richard Branson was on board, by the way, when all that happened. In spite of the fact that that was only a slight deviation from the from the approved flight path, that was still a mishap. They had to submit that to the FAA. The FAA investigated Virgin Galactic, the, the whole shooting match, before they allowed them to fly again. And that's what we can expect every time that there's any sort of flight that doesn't go exactly as uh, as planned. And that sucks. And that does delay things, but it is what, especially if we're talking about what is essentially a gigantic ballistic missile, um, you got to do it for, for the safety of the public. It's just too important. It's flying too close to inhabited areas um, to do it any other way. Um, and by the way, this is a, a huge, huge group, definitely. Pressure and tank won't prevent slosh. There's a whole lot of discussion going on here, by the way. Uh, super appreciated once once again. Um, here's an interesting question. If Starship loses a few tiles before re-entry, will the tiles alongside protect to a point where a bare patch? Well, if, if, if they lose any tiles, it still might not blow up because um, the space shuttle lost tiles on almost every flight. On the first flight of the space shuttle, actually, Space Shuttle Columbia, a fair number of heat tiles were actually lost on that flight, and yet it safely re-entered. There's a tremendous amount of wiggle room um, redundancy built into heat shields, um, whereby the loss of a few tiles shouldn't have a significant impact on the, on the re-entry. It's only when you have a big loss of tiles, um, for example, the, uh, the debris strike prior to Columbia's ill-fated flight that really did a lot of damage to the heat shield. Those are the sorts of things that can lead to, to catastrophe. Um, and, you know, once again, these are the sorts of things that are going to have to be thoroughly uh, investigated. And again, if you lose a lot of the heat shield, then, you know, Starship could burn up and debris could end up falling in a place that, uh, that you didn't anticipate. All of those things could be classified as mishaps. All of those will require mishap reports. 
again, it's just a process and it's a process that's going to be a huge pain in the ass until Starship is actually flying reliably, until Starship is performing exactly as SpaceX expects it to perform. And I think that you know we're going to get there. And I think that we could get there perhaps even this year at some point. Um, you know, have a have a, a flight that exactly corresponds to the flight plan. But I don't even think it's going to happen on the next launch. Um, even if Starship does manage to get to orbit, you know, and all that, I think there will still be things that will differ from the flight plan that will once again require a mishap report. Um, so let's see. Uh, Rock Rums is making it more complicated. There are critical tiles. Losing a couple of means loss emission on critical locations where you can lose several. Yeah, that's a, that's a very good point. Some tiles uh, protect very important areas of the rocket; others, not so much. Um, <laughs> it's 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 very difficult stuff, and that's why it's rocket science, guys. That's why we have really talented, really intelligent, well-educated engineers working on this stuff um, because it is so damn difficult. So to get onto the topic then uh, to kind of shift gears then onto okay, well, if Starship fl flies in February, let's assume that it assume that it does. And then let's assume that it's a relatively good flight that they managed to achieve orbit doesn't go entirely according to plan with re-entry or something along those lines or the booster doesn't come down exactly where we want it to you know, requires another mishap report, et cetera. And, and perhaps let's say it takes until OFT4 or OFT5 before Starship actually flies the way it's supposed to. What's the next step? Well, the next step is reusability, um, booster capture. That's going to be a whole different animal. And that has to be accomplished too before Starship can become a fully operational and very competitive rocket as opposed to just a big expendable super rocket. Um, so we've got that in front of us. Um, and, and those flights, most probably, I can't imagine that they're not going to have a couple of those flights where they're doing booster capture that aren't going to result in some kind of mishap or anomaly. I can't imagine that they're going to be 100% successful with a booster capture on the first try. I would say there's a very good chance that we're going to have a couple of exploding boosters, at least a couple, um, before that before they get that process down. Um, so hopefully, and this, of course, is one of the reasons why Elon said that he is hoping that we can do a test of ship to ship refueling in 2024, but he's really confident about 2025 translation. I don't think that we're going to have a ship to ship refueling test until 2025. I really don't think that that's going to happen. I don't think we're going to get the cadence down for these uh, for Starship to where we can um, have two Starships launching, you know, in close enough proximity or to one another in terms of launch times, et cetera, in order to get, a, you know, one of these tests implemented. It's I think it'll it'll be 2025, I think, before we're going to say that. I just got a I just got a suggestion saying that if SpaceX manages to do a ship to ship refueling test in 2024, then the the ass tattoo is back. It's not a bad idea. Maybe maybe I should do that. Oh, Musk fanboy says, geez, geez, Louise, you're really taking it to extremes, producer. He wants me to do Musk fanboy if, if he manages to pull that off. I'm very confident about it, actually. I'm not going to make the commitment during this live stream, but I will think very seriously about it. We'll put it that way. Um, but I'm feeling pretty confident that we're not going to have a ship-to-ship -ship refueling test in 2024. I'll, I'll think long and hard about whether or not I'm that confident, but I'm pretty confident. So, you know, and once again, th the reason I'm mentioning all of this the reason i'm saying okay you know what are the the steps that are coming up next is because i'm trying to go into why i was so frustrated by nasa's announcement for artemis 3 i really think that that was an irresponsible announcement on their on their part i think it would have been better i think it would have put less pressure on spacex 
and made it a lot more possible for us to have a successful Artemis 3 mission is if they changed the nature of Artemis 3 to getting the Lunar Gateway operational um, and to put a crew on the Lunar Gateway for a few weeks or something like that. I think that that would have been a better alternative Artemis 3 than, oh yeah, we're going to do it in September of 2026. Seriously, guys, really? You think that's going to happen when even Elon Musk is saying that he feels confident that 2025 he's going to have his first test of ship to ship refueling. You really think, NASA, that we're going to get from the point to where Starship is doing a, its first ship to ship refueling test in 2025 and then in 21 months, we're going to go from the first test of that to humans landing on the moon. Seriously? With Lunar Starship? No way. Now that's something I'll commit to right now, by the way. I'd, I'll do some kind of tattoo if, if we actually have Artemis 3 happen on September of 2026. It ain't going to happen. There is no way we're going to get from where we are now in two years and nine months to where Starship is putting human beings on the surface of the moon. There's simply too many steps that need to be implemented between now and then. And I think by setting that date, rather than changing the, the critical path, which I think would have been a better move, we are really putting SpaceX behind the eight ball, making it very difficult, you know, just setting really, I mean, once again, it doesn't surprise me that Elon Musk accepted the challenge because, you know, he, he, he throws dates around all the time, you know, but, but NASA doesn't work on Elon time. So, you know, you're going to hold feet to the fire on this one if they made a commitment for this date. And if we're nowhere near that, you know, by September of 2026, I think that's going to put unnecessary pressure on SpaceX. I think what would be better is to do something that doesn't require Starship for Artemis 3. Let's do Lunar Gateway, and we're going to need it anyway. Let's put some astronauts on the space station, have a space station-related mission, the first astronauts to you know be on a space station orbiting the moon. I think that that would be an incredible accomplishment, a real incredible accomplishment for Artemis 3. Let's just, let's change tack. You know, it... I mean, I understand there was a time when, you know, where we had a firm plan for Artemis 3 to be landing in 2024. And there were a couple of companies that were working on that from, you know, from a realistic chance of success. And not really, but, you know, at least targeting that, you know, with and, and that was Dynetics and that was Blue Origin and the national team. Although Blue Origin and the national team solution was a cobbled together piece of trash that was essentially nothing more than a bunch of spacecraft that already existed being hammered together. That's how they were going to make that work. The Blue Moon Lander, which essentially is complete at this point, or close to complete. Then the uh, the um, Orion being part of that. Essentially, all it was was a modified Orion and a modified Cygnus resupply ship. That's all the Blue Origin Lander was. That was accomplishable simply because they were you know ships that already existed. But you know, Starship from the from at that time probably not very doable especially as we know definitely not doable in 2024 dynetics probably not either but they might have been able to get somewhere close if they had had the financial support michael maxi thank you so much for your support um will nelson approve of using hls's starship launch in 2025 as the initial lunar gateway module no and i'll tell you why even though that's a good idea there's too much work being done on Lunar Gateway right now by contracted partners um, who are heavily engaged in this process. Um, we have the power and propulsion element from Maxar that's almost done. In fact, I think it is done at this point. Um, we have the Halo module, um, the first habitable module that is nearly done or, you know, that sort of thing. The power and propulsion element that's uh, solar electric ion engine, um, it's a pretty big one actually, used to push the lunar gateway around. It is not designed to push around 100 tons worth of stainless steel. 
There's no way you could adapt the PPE to Starship. Um, so there's just too much. It's all, and of course, you also have the IHAB module from the European Space Agency. Um, they've invested a lot of time in that as well, and we're expected to to be delivering that too. So I really don't think that uh, that we're going to have that radical of a change in Lunar Gateway. Um, and also, you know, we have the capability of getting all of these modules out there essentially now. Both uh, Halo, IHAB, Halo, and the PPE are designed to be delivered by Falcon Heavy. As a matter of fact, Falcon Heavy is capable of delivering both the power and propulsion element and the, uh, and the Halo module in one go. A single launch, it can put both of those modules out there. Um, so yeah, I, even though Lunar Gateway, I think could have a lot of practical uses, obviously as an orbiting starship, um, because it's so damn big and has so much habitable space, I really don't think we're going to, we're going to get that radical of a change, um, right off, um, on, on, off the bat. I think it's very unlikely. Alan, you're right. Gateway's tiny inside. It's ridiculously small module. I'm not saying I agree with the configuration or how it's been designed because I don't. Um, I think it's going to be a, an uncomfortably confined area, especially for four astronauts. If you add the habitable volume of, of Orion onto it, makes it a little bit bigger, might, might make it you know, more manageable. But still, it is going to be a pain um, to live on that station. There's no question. What they should have done is they should have gone with Sierra Space's solution and done at least one inflatable module, one life module there, which would have had 300 cubic meters worth of space in that one module. Attach that to the PPE. Those would have worked very well together. But unfortunately, NASA still doesn't trust inflatable modules. Um, so unfortunately they didn't go with that route. I think ultimately we will see an inflatable module on Lunar Gateway. I think it will be implemented, um, at some point. Um, but, and it's just not yet, unfortunately. But yeah, I mean, that's, that's my opinion. I really think that, that we cannot say with any sort of seriousness that Lunar Starship is going to be prepared to have, be human rated and to put astronauts on the moon by September of 2026. I think it's silly to even set those kinds of dates. Um, what I think would be better is to either set a more realistic date or change Artemis 3. I think changing Artemis 3 is, is the better of those two solutions. Let's put astronauts on the Lunar Gateway because they're going to have to live there eventually. We're going to have to learn how to how to live not only on the moon, but in deep space. That's part of what Artemis is all about. Artemis is about learning how to survive outside of the protective envelope of our magnetic field out in deep space. And orbiting the moon is really no different than going from here to Mars as far as that kind of environment is concerned. It's practically identical. So if we could have a mission dedicated to the idea of putting astronauts on the Lunar Gateway and seeing how well they hold up for three, four weeks, you know, a month, something like that, I think that that would be a really good mission that would teach us a hell of a lot about, um, about the process of surviving in deep space and, uh, and traveling between the planets. Um, but, once, but sadly, <laughs> sadly, um, I'm not the guy in charge. So once again, to tie it up, um, Elon says that it uh, looks like we, we've identified what caused the problems with it. However, we don't have an, an announcement from the FAA thus far that they have received a mishap report from SpaceX yet. Um, so that's an interesting inconsistency. Um, one that I think needs to be addressed before we really know how soon this launch is actually going to be taking place. Um, so hopefully, um, I'm going to be sending a communication over to the FAA on Monday, actually. I'm going to ask them, look, guys, this is what Elon is saying. Did you get the mishap report from SpaceX? They should be able to answer that question as to whether or not they even received the mishap report. And I'll let you know 
what they have to say once I get my response. Um, in the meantime, guys, I really appreciate you folks tuning in. Looking forward to all the exciting stuff coming up in 2024. Oh, one other thing. I also received a thank you from Astrobotic for the uh, video that I released yesterday. Um, kind of showing some love and some appreciation for all the hard work they put in to trying to keep Peregrine alive. I hope they can keep that uh, probe operating for a little bit longer and maybe crash it into the moon. That would be something at least. But um, obviously, I'll keep you up to date on all of that as well. So again, thank you very much for watching. And until next time, stay angry about space.